Welcome. My name is Cindy Anderson. I'm a professor in sociology. I am really excited to uh, moderate this panel today with these students. I think it's going to be, well, excuse me, former students. Former, I know so many of them as students, so it's really special to have them back um, and sharing about their career. So I will introduce each of them and ask them a question or so. The difficult part is going to be kind of, we've got six people and limited time, but I also want you all to have a chance to ask questions, so we'll just kind of see how these, these things work out. So welcome, and I will start uh, at this end introducing Nathan Edge. Nathan has a bachelor's in sociology and a minor in business administration. He graduated in 2010. He is, the title is garden manager at Hattie's Garden in Akron, yep. right? Um, and he'll tell you more about that position because it's more than just going out and trimming the flowers or planting seeds. So he'll talk about that. Next we have Cam Bailey. Cam is a social crim major. Uh, he has a certificate from the Law Justice Center. Graduated recently, 2005. Um, Cam is a caseworker for the Hopewell Health Center and works with the Southeastern Ohio Regional Jail. Um, we have Natasha. Natasha Lorenz has a bachelor's in social crim, graduated in 2014. Uh, she's recently accepted um, our offer to join us in the uh, master's program in sociology. So she'll be starting her master's degree, and I say you're already going to expect it in 2017 um, in sociology. Natasha, if you can't tell, she works for the OUPD. Okay, the police department there. Um, <coughs> next we have Stacy Vaughn. Stacy has a master's in sociology. Um, is, she got that in 2015. Stacy's current position is with um, uh, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, and she is employed with AmeriCorps, Vista, and I'll let you explain how that works and what's cool about that. Um, Amy Slavin. Amy has a bachelor's from here. Uh, she got in 2013, then she stuck around and got a master's in 2014. She is an investigator with the Franklin County Public Defender's Office. Um, and Clara Festmeyer. Clara has a bachelor's in psych and a minor in soch from Ohio University in 2013. She got a master's in sociology in 2015. And she works with the Butler County Child and Family Services. So I'm going to open it up and ask you all each to just briefly tell us about your job, what you like about it, and we'll start with that one. What do you like about your current job? Clara, why don't you start? Why don't I start? Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so as Dr. Anderson said, I work with Butler County Children's Services. Um, I'm a case manager, so um, I think what I like most about my job is that um, Obviously, working in children's services, a lot of cases of abuse and neglect come in that are very traumatizing, um, even for the workers working them along with the families. Um, but we have good cases, so when I get to see a case to the end, I've seen two to the end so far, um, where they've been set up with services and, and counseling and watching them grow and feeling confident closing their case, knowing that they're going to succeed, is what I like most about my job. Thank you. Amy? Okay, so I'm an investigator with the uh, Franklin County Public Defender's Office. So basically, I, everyone knows there are prosecutors and defense attorneys. So my job as an investigator is um, attorneys send in investigation requests, and they say, okay, here's the client, here's the defendant, the facts of the case, this is what I need, I need you to interview the witness, I need you to do background checks. I mean, it's a wide array, it could be anything from a background check to go to the jail and interview these 16 people, um, talk to the victim's families, talk to the defendant's families, kind of investigation slash um, mitigation type work. Um, I guess what I like most about it is that no one day is ever the same. I spend a lot of time in my car, I travel to a lot of different um, environments, a lot of different neighborhoods to try to track down witnesses or victims. Um, and I mean it spans from you know traffic violations to can you get can you get the video footage from this traffic stop from the police cruiser from whatever or can you go interview a child rape victim like the the, the breadth the span of the is intense and no one day is ever the same so oh thank you so um as Dr. Anderson said, I'm in AmeriCorps. So AmeriCorps, um, we say it's basically Peace Corps but domesticated, so working here in the States with poverty. 
So my site is at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. So I'm doing um, a year of service, which there's a stipend attached and other benefits. Um, but what I like most about my job is the food bank has me working with our agencies and with volunteers. So some days um, I'm out at sites or traveling with work and um, holding trainings or teaching or making sure that our agencies are being compliant with state regu regulations. And then other days I spend in the office, so building reports. Um, they do trainings on how to geocode and with grant writing. Um, and then with the data that we collect at the food bank, we're tr like tracking poverty rates and where are people coming from, where are they going to get their food, what are the demographics of the family. Um, we track race and ethnicity in the area, so we build reports and maps and then our CEO and um, other vice presidents of the food bank, they travel to Columbus and D.C. with this data to um, just lobby for more funds and try to break a lot of the myths that are surrounding poverty. So my job is mostly going to the agencies to make sure they're collecting the data and then cleaning it up at the office. So similar to as they said, so the days are always different and it's been um, a great learning experience. So trying to like build up your resume and gain different skills. Hi, I'm Natasha. Um, I don't suppose I need to describe the position of police officer to you guys. Um, it's tough to pick my favorite part. Uh, similar to pretty much all the jobs here, I'm sure every day is different. Uh, you don't get the same thing twice, and um, it's, it's a constant learning, it's a constant challenging of your skills and your abilities, and um, I think that's probably my favorite part, just that every day I have an opportunity to learn and to grow because every day presents, presents new challenges. Um, yeah, so I work for Hopewell Mental Health, which is a community mental health center in Athens. And uh, I'm based out of the regional jail in Nelsonville. And what I typically do is work with anyone with a severe mental illness that's booked into the jail. And uh, my project is designed to reduce um, the probability of someone being transferred to the psychiatric hospital. So providing uh, severely mentally ill people with services in the jail and then when they get out of jail, uh, making sure that they stay out of jail. So it's also about reducing uh, the recidivism rate. People with mental illnesses find themselves um, in jail longer and back in jail quicker than people without uh, those illnesses. So it's really uh, trying to situationally place them in the community so that they are uh, prepared to deal with their sickness and uh, and don't find themselves in trouble again. So it's a lot of uh, a lot of linkage with resources, lots of coordination with other agencies, and um, I think what I like best about it is seeing cases to the end um, and meeting someone in jail who tried to hang themselves and then six months later getting them in their own apartment and um, getting them a job and just seeing, even though not being, you're not even, it's, you're never really thanked for helping clients just because they, they can't sometimes process what you're doing, but you know that you're doing something good and that you're you're helping the community so that's definitely my best my most favorite aspect of it is um, is seeing the long-term effects of of services yeah my job is, has been a combination of things um, I'm technically a Hattie's Gardens manager but that program is uh, a little bit more robust than what the title might suggest uh, Hattie's Gardens is part of Hattie Larlam Foundation and it provides services for people with disabilities across a number of different areas. So it can be children with profound or severe disabilities up to adults with high functioning uh, disability, uh, which is mainly who I work with. Uh, and my job is to be able to train these folks, these adults with uh, mild disabilities to um, bridge that gap between high school into community employment. So I'm really a vocational trainer uh, in that regard. Um, but I do that through agriculture and, and local food production. And so Hattie's Gardens is a combination of both of those things. Uh, we take in adults with disabilities and work on their technical and soft skills, get them ready for the community and uh, competitive employment, uh, but we do a lot to promote local food. Um, we have eight acres of production in the Akron area, and so we're doing a lot of organic vegetable production, food production, and um, the combination of both those things has been, uh, been really nice. That's, I think, what I enjoy most about this. Uh, it's a combination of my work in sociology and also uh, with uh, the business administration. Um, I think the most re rewarding part is, is just, um, as Cam was saying, kind of helping folks to achieve their goals and take steps to better their lives. So for me that means uh, taking um, adults that don't necessarily have the skills to, to go out into a typical workplace um, and work with them over a course of 
several months or, or a year and get them into a position where they feel confident and independent enough to, uh, to work in the community. Uh, so I think that's probably the most rewarding part of my, my job. Okay, so I'd like to ask you what, for each of you, what was your favorite class when you were at Ohio University? Cam, you want to start? What was your favorite class? You want me to start? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my favorite class uh, was, I would say, I can't, I can't pick. It has to be criminology or punishment society. It's not theory. No. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't theory. Um, I took punishment society and criminology concurrently in a summer semester online. So I read a lot of books that were basically kind of built off of each other. And that's really what got me interested in rehabilitation and reducing recidivism and working with um, a criminal population to uh, make sure that they are cared for and that they don't find themselves in jail or prison again. So right. it'd be a combination of those two. Okay, good. Who else? Clara? Uh, should have made eye contact. <laughs> uh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I took juvenile delinquency with that guy over there. Um, I, I think, I mean, I took so many great classes and I was trying to think earlier, back to undergrad, which seems like it was a bazillion years ago. Um, but I think that juvenile delinquency was one of the classes, because at the time I was still a psychology major. Um, I didn't know really anything about sociology. I, I knew that I liked it, but I, I didn't really know what it was or, you know, I was trying to get a feel and then I got into criminology and I was like, ooh, I really like this. Um, and juvenile delinquency was one of the courses that kind of really spurred my interest in the like justice system and how it impacts young people. And so I guess that kind of, and then juvenile delinquency was one of my main um, areas when I graduated from graduate school. I was still interested in it, and I still am, so mm -hmm. I think juvenile delinquency. Okay. See, I was going to say that too. I was in between, my answer is crime and deviance uh, grad seminar that I took in graduate school. But I took juvenile delinquency with you the last semester of my senior year. So I was <laughs> just a little mentally checked out at that point. So I wish I had been maybe a sophomore or junior when I was taking it. But I would say the Crime and Deviance seminar taught by uh, Dr. Thomas Vanderven, um, mainly because, it, I mean, it was kind of true of all uh, graduate seminars. But the emphasis um, and the encouragement of the free flow conversation, I mean, nothing against, you know, your wonderful PowerPoints that you spend so much time putting together. But when I look back at my education, I don't remember the bullet points and the PowerPoint slides. I remember the discussion and all the opinions and perspectives that, I mean, I'm sure all of you have experienced that at one point when, you know, and especially in sociology, they try to encourage class discussion and just hearing someone's opinion, like, and that aha moment, like, oh my God, I had never thought about that before. And so that was really, really, they honed in on that a lot in our, uh, in our graduate seminars, but especially crime and deviance. Um, it was probably my favorite just because it was the most applicable to my career now which I don't want to get too much into that because I know that's another question, so I'll stop there. <laughs> All right. Natasha, what about you? Um, your favorite class? I think that my, uh, my capstone in homicide was definitely, uh -huh. it was kind of my focus. I read serial killer books in my free time, so that was kind of <laughs> like, like, that was ideal. I went to class every day like, this is awesome. I can't wait to hear what's going to happen today, so. Cool. All right. Nathan? Um, I have a couple. I mean, there's, I think it was deviant behavior. I forget who was teaching it at the time. Uh, but that, that wasn't necessarily applicable to what I'm doing now, but that was always an interesting thing to me. Uh, and then my capstone project was sociology of food with Dr. Burmeister, and, and that kind of led me into the local food aspect of what I'm doing now. Uh, it wasn't something I was necessarily that interested in before, but I think uh, just taking that course uh, kind of drove me into that, that interest at least, and then when this position came up, it uh, you know, I took advantage of it, I guess. so. So that's the one that stuck with me the most. So Stacy, I know you don't have the undergrad to draw from. You weren't you were at a, another institution for undergraduate, <laughs> but you were here for your graduate mm -hmm. work. What classes did you like or what was your favorite class? Um, mine too, similar to what you said, um, maybe weren't something you were interested in before. Mine were um, a teaching course, a teaching seminar before mm -hmm. we started teaching, and then um, a quantitative methods class that was taught by Dr. Welser. Mm -hmm. So 
I never thought I would have an interest in teaching, but after taking the course, realizing that I loved that. And then same with quantitative methods. So I always was never really interested in math courses or learning how to work all these different programs, but then like with a great instructor and then learning how to do it and feeling confident in that. So with both of those classes, um, like with the position I am now, so finding employers who want someone with those skills and then being able to use them together um, has really made those two classes my favorite because they're like so desired in this position that I'm in now. Great, great. Um, how about telling us uh, some unexpected ways your sociology degree impacts your career? Because you may want to think about that for a minute. So you all have different types of careers, different things going on, and sociology pushed you in these directions for it. But what unexpected ways can you see sociology popping up in your day-to-day -day work? Yeah? I'll go. Okay. <laughs> you can tell us well, a little one, more about your yeah, job. Well, this, yeah, this was kind of the question that I was most excited to talk about, only because, um, so I took a lot of criminology classes, and my job is, I mean, I'm working for defense attorneys. I'm working for the people who are defending the clients, the defendants who have charges brought against them. So you have, I mean, I'm investigating. I don't, I'm not trying to like, oh, you're saying he like raped this girl? No, he didn't. Like, that's not the job. But I'm, I'm out there and I'm talking to victims. I'm talking to the mothers of child rape victims. And it's hard. You don't want to be like, no, I'm on the side of the guy that you're saying did it. But the, the bottom line is, is that these are, and all my, th these guys are people. They're all humans and they've committed awful acts. And I, I wish I could say that more people that come through our office are innocent. But the fact of the matter is, like, there's criminals. They commit crimes every single day. They, you know, it just happens. But when you're sitting across from someone, if I go to jail, this person has been accused of felonious assault or attempted murder or murder, multiple homicide, whatever, you're sitting across from them. And it's like, this is a person who has been dealt a shit hand. And, you know, if you can mitigate it or take proper steps to, like, okay, maybe... I don't know, if I did this, I could maybe get you the proper help that you need because all these people come from, you know, very impoverished families, very impoverished um, backgrounds and environments. And, I mean, the, the percentage is overwhelming. You know, people who, you know, accuse rapists, more often than not, they have been molested or raped themselves in childhood or what have you. So I guess the classes that I took, the crim, the crim classes, um, especially uh, criminology, those crime and deviance we did, went through all the crim theories and it kind of um, explains why people commit crime. People in these circumstances commit crimes because of X, because of Y, because of Z. And when you're sitting across from someone that has committed these crimes, it's like, okay, yeah, you did something really bad, but I can kind of understand why, because you came from unfortunate circumstances. So, you know, the, the, the understanding of basic human nature, I think, is something that we can all relate to, that we saw in our sociology and our crim classes. So, yeah, it's very useful. Yeah. Yeah, mine's mine's a little different. I mean, the <clears throat> just the ability to to conceptualize where people are coming from and and their backgrounds and how they might view the world, I think, has been the most useful part. Um, we've been doing a lot of development of um, education courses around local food on top of what we're doing for training. Um, and we have two very different areas that we're working in. We, we work in a, a small town called Bath, which is uh, like where LeBron James lives and, and a very high income area. But we're also doing a lot of work in the inner city of, of Akron. So um, to be able to try to bridge both of those communities together through, through food and through our training programs has been, has been difficult. Uh, there's different expectations for both areas. And we want to be able to sure, be sure that we're promoting access of food to both localities. Um, but I think that takes into account understanding how both different, both neighborhoods or both communities or populations would think about food and think about uh, in terms of finances and, and how they really conceptualize access to food and how they might use that. So being able to, to internalize that and, and really think about uh, what would make the most impact or how do you connect with these people on, on a very basic level in terms of food, um, I think sociology has been able to, uh, for me at least, to be able to conceptualize that and, and take into account the differences in, in culture and, and community and that sort of things. I can go. 
um, to get really nerdy, um, but I think like what Amy, when Amy was talking, that's exactly I've felt the exact same way since day one um, at my job because like so C. Wright Mills, who might be like my favorite sociologist, I might, eh, maybe he's up there, but he's pretty cool. Um, but his emphasis on understanding history and biography to understand why someone lives the way they do or why they view the world in a certain way is so, so, so important. Because, you know, if I have a client who is a perpetrator of a really awful, awful case of child abuse and neglect, um, it's easy to go out there and be like, hey, like, what, what are you doing? And to accuse them and to point fingers and they're an awful person. And then to get back at the office and then look through their history, they've been involved with us as a child they were physically abused themselves and put through absolute hell. Um, and to look back at all their history, they aged out, you know, at 16, they started living by themselves, started having kids at that age too. And to understand, you know, this might be the only thing that they've ever known in their life. So why would they do anything differently? So just because you and I view something one way, doesn't mean that they, that they view it that way. And I think that's really, really important when you're interacting with someone who has different views from you because it's going to shut you down and you're not going to be able to empathize with anyone and I, I just think it's so 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 important sociology is so important because of that emphasis on biography and on history and trying to really get inside someone else's shoes and feel it out for yourself and I think that it's something that I try to do every day and I feel like it it's made my life a lot easier and it's I, I can't stress it enough, but what Amy was saying, it's so, so important. Yeah. Stacey, could you pick up and tell us a little bit about the quantitative skills? You mentioned mm -hmm. that a data analysis class was really helpful to you, and you use that regularly. Yeah. Tell us a little more so, about what you do with numbers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my job is working with the numbers, so I'll get nerdy with Clara. So <laughs> if you were in Northeast Ohio, so I, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, we serve six counties and you needed to go get food at a food pantry. So um, there's also a misconception which sociology helped with in my degree here. Um, you know, you might have to be really, really poor to be on assistance or need help from a food pantry, but um, our food pantries are 200% of the poverty level. So a lot of our clients are working full time or multiple jobs. And um, so it's been interesting to work with the agencies and then also see the clients come in. So it used to be previously that if you went to a food bank to get food, you would sign a Ohio Department of Job and Family Services form. And it was still, I believe, like 2013, and all of these forms are on paper. So if a politician wanted to say, you know, this person's going to the food bank every day that they can, multiple times a month, or, you know, maybe driving to the next county over to get food there, maybe there's, you know, um, for whatever reason. But now, um, if you were to go into a food bank, we can sign them in online. So my job is making sure um, the agencies know how to check clients in online. So we pull reports from like each agency. So how many households are they serving? And then how many are with children and seniors? Um, unduplicated visits throughout the year, average household size, race and ethnicity. So we're able to see all of the numbers. So when it comes to the quantitative class um, that I took here, so learning at my site, the databases that they're using and managing that. Um, it basically comes down to grant writing. So being able to take those reports and say, who are we serving in this county and in this city? What money do they need? Um, and then we also were able to build maps. So if anyone's interested in geocoding, we can take maps. So this is Columbus, actually, when they went to lobby for money there. Um, like the dots represent households that we're serving, and then the different shades of blue are how much poverty is in each area. So um, in Solon County, which is this one, which is up towards Cleveland, um, it's a very wealthy area, but we're finding that a lot of people are driving from poorer areas to go to Solon's food pantries because people might be donating more money or their legislators might be giving them more money. Or also with this map, um, that's where the jobs are at. So um, if they're coming and driving to a different county to go to work, then that's, that might be where they're getting food. So it's been interesting to see like what the numbers represent and what they mean and then also along the lines of what you were saying, like these are people in you know, specific situations or certain situations that need help and um, they need funding. So being able to go out to the agencies and teach them how to check in clients with a computer. So um, a lot of volunteers at food banks are in their 80s. So when I tell Shirley at um, a food bank down the road to 
you know, turn the laptop on, go to Google Chrome, because Internet Explorer doesn't work that well. Type in pantrytrack.com and you're going to log in. She's like, I don't know what you mean by click. So, like, <laughs> having the patience and the critical thinking to be like, this is a keypad. I don't need to teach you what a mouse is because you've never worked with a laptop and how to move the mouse and how to click on things. Um, so it's been really interesting to do the teaching aspect of it, which is something I didn't think I'd be doing that my job loves that I'm able to do, and then also work with the data to pull reports and write different grants that represent like what exactly is going on with poverty in Northeast Ohio. I don't know if I can piggyback off sure. that. I, you know, we haven't had the chance to talk too much, but I, we, I do a lot of the same thing you know, in my position. Uh, we work a lot with what's termed food deserts, and these are all gathered through surveys in terms of uh, income level, and then access certainly to to grocery stores or fresh food markets, um, and that's something that we've we've had to deal with a lot is is that uh, the data bring that in and making sure that whatever programs we're putting forth are having the greatest impact. So yeah, certainly those skills on on taking in data and seeing where you you'd be most effective have been have been really important to my position too. Um, Natasha, I'm going to switch and ask you all a little bit different questions, but Natasha, you. Um, graduated in 2014 and you've been working with the OUPD. What influenced your decision to be interested in a master's degree in sociology? Many people in here, undergrads that are thinking about their futures, and we've got some grad students, but what made you come to that decision? Um, I've gotten that question a lot recently and I'm, I'm going to nerd it up a little bit too. I really miss school. Oh, um, okay. I, I miss my professors and I miss going to Bentley every day. Um, but I also, um, I'm kind of a tumbling tumbleweed right now and I don't know where I'm going to be in five years mm -hmm. in terms of you know whether I'm going to be here, whether I'm going to be at the department. So um, there are a lot of uh, FBI jobs I've been looking at farther up and um, more you see with those those federal level jobs, they want master's degrees. Mm -hmm. But um, first and foremost, I just decided that I, I missed school, I wanted to go back and you know having an extra degree can't hurt. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cam, uh, now that you've been out of school for about a year, right, and you've been in your job, and so you're totally different status now, what's something that you wish you'd have done differently when you were a student at OU? Um, what's something that you'd like to have known or done that you didn't have uh, the opportunity for? I think the first thing I can think of is I graduated in three years, uh -huh. and all of my, my class right now is graduating, and uh, I just didn't get to experience a senior year. I crammed like 20 credits in my last four semesters. Um, so right off the bat, I could think of just like, I shouldn't have rushed it. Uh, I loved, I love working and I love taking classes while I work. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't like going to school and then not applying it in the field at all. Um, so definitely the first thing I can just think of doing something differently is not rushing my undergraduate career. Um, I guess that's what I would do differently. I don't have any regrets other than that. Uh, everyone gets to celebrate a senior year. I just, unfortunately, my senior year was online in the summer. So. All right, thank you. Um, before we open it up to audience questions, I'd like to give each of you the opportunity to say something that I haven't asked or that you think is important to share today. Um, and if you don't, if you want to, we can go straight to audience questions, but uh, I'll give you that opportunity first. Anything about your job that you'd like to, that you're especially proud of, or? One of my um, coworkers, she's a public defense attorney, and she, she's a little out there, but she posted on Facebook this morning a, a meme or whatever, and it said, oh, you know what they say, privileged kids get therapy and poor kids get jail. And I don't know, just kind of what, what you and I were kind of talking about, that it's very important to emphasize, and I think the degree in the school and our professors kind of helped us realize this important to remember that just because people are impoverished, you know, victims of their circumstance doesn't mean that they're total barbarians. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. Um, yeah. I'm sure that no one here is a stranger to, you know, the, the recent public perceptions and the media coverage of the police. And um, whenever I get a chance to talk to people like this face to face, I, I kind of just like to emphasize that um, that the, the things that are going on in the media, the things that we're all hearing about, as horrible as they are, are isolated incidents, as, as strange as that seems, and um, because that's all we hear about. But um, every single 
person that I work with at OUPD is a good person. They're, they're kind people that really care about their work and they really care about the fact that they get to help you guys and they get to, you know, if one of you guys is in trouble, that's, that's what they go to work for is to help you guys out. And um, I, I think that that's something that isn't highlighted enough that the reason that we get into this job is because we feel a need to give back and um, that's something that I don't think is, is highlighted enough. I could um, feed off of Cam, kind of like with your advice on your senior year. My um, advice from my experience, I really thought um, I would get my degree and then get right into like a high paying job that was super specific to what I liked. And um, so I would like prepare yourselves or think about being super flexible. So any classes you can take to build your resume, your skills, um, internships now, unpaid internships, volunteering, making connections, so being super flexible, and then once that time comes where you're applying, um, apply for everything that you possibly can, and then when you're there or in that position, um, meeting everybody, doing informational interviews with you know the higher ups, get your name out there, and then being able to sell yourself so you can start practicing that now. Like, um, why are you hireable? Um, what skills do you have? Because you all do. So just being able to say it and phrase it and get it out there. Um, and just being flexible in the beginning. Um, so my thing was just patience. I wanted it all as soon as like the day after graduation. So, but I don't know, so just be patient and flexible. Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> I, I didn't have any background in services for people with disabilities or anything, but I, I knew I wanted to mesh the sociology degree with, um, with that minor business. I, I do see like nonprofit work as valuable work and it, it's a way to really impact change, I think. Uh, significantly but as you said I was kind of flexible on like you know what positions were offered to me to begin with and um, and from that I started as managing one of these cafes for the same kind of vocational training program it wasn't something I wanted to be doing necessarily but when they started talking about getting this local food program going and everything I made sure that when I heard that I volunteered you know my time to help them and, and kind of gave them my qualifications, if you will, like with the background in sociology and food and and made sure that they understood that I'd be interested in working on that project and from there everything just snowballed into, into where it is now. So I agree, being flexible um, and uh, yeah, making yourself valuable in any way you can. If you can swing an unpaid internship, definitely it's a great way to get your name out there and it shows that, I mean, you're taking a position unpaid, it shows that you're really interested and passionate about this subject matter so and usually I mean most of them are pretty flexible with your hours because they're not paying you so serve on the side or something but definitely definitely if you can swing an unpaid internship <coughs> try to I'd say don't be afraid to continue your education after your bachelor's degree um, when I graduated I couldn't even fathom going back to school but then kind of like what Natasha said you start to miss it after a while and I knew I wanted to continue working because I love working. So this summer I'm doing, I'm starting online master's classes at Boise State for social work. So I'm still gonna be working full time. Um, and it's a part time program that runs three years. So it's kind of like a dream come true. I get to get a master's degree, but still get to go out and do stuff every day and have fun. Um, and you're young, so a lot of people don't wanna have to go back to school when they're in their 40s. Um, my wife, I think, wants kids like in three years, so I don't want to have to go to grad school like raising a baby. So <laughs> I, uh, that's another conversation. For time. <laughs> I just I want to get it done early, and I yeah encourage everyone to kind of really think through that. Um, it'd be it'd be great to be 26 or 27 and be done with school and be able to pursue your career. If I could just add one thing, I feel the energy lagging. Um, so just kind of to wrap it up. Um, don't let anyone, as a sociology major or someone that's interested in sociology, don't let anyone tell you that you can't get a job, okay? Because I heard it so much. It's like, <coughs> what's your major? Oh, I'm a sociology. What do you, what's that or what do you want to do, okay? Because you're marketable and you still have skills and so your sociology education is so, so valuable. And I think that sometimes we hear that it's not because it's a soft science or it's a social science. It's like. You have skills and you are marketable, so market yourself, okay? Because you can get a job. <laughs> you can get a job because we're all up here. So. Yeah. Right. Great point. Let's open it up for questions and feel free to ask a question individually or to the whole panel. Um, but 
this is a open session, so I'd love to hear some questions from the audience. Uh, so, are you familiar with the certificate? Like, what you have to do for it? I mean, like, what, what, did it help you, like, how did it help you get a job, and, like, what did you have to do for it? Was it, like, a one-year program? It was, uh, the Certificate in Law, Justice, and Culture is through the Center for Law, Justice, and Culture, and I think it was nine, it was, like, th two core classes, and then, like, nine elective credits, and... I don't necessarily think that influenced my job, because my job's more of a social work role, um, but it did introduce me to those core classes, like the law, the law, Justice, and Culture class, and then another core class that I can't think of, but you can't take those unless you're in the certificate program, and then you get introduced to more faculty through that, um, and it really, it, it introduced me to a lot more people that I can put on references and stuff, and my, um, my professor who led that certificate program, Dr. Sullivan, in the poli sci department is typically like a reference on every single application I submitted. Um, but for my specific job right now, I don't think it helped me get it. Um, but I think in the long run it will because it just it would just introduce you a lot more professors and a lot more students that you can still talk to after you graduate. So I still highly recommend it. Maya? I can kind of touch on that. So okay. I had no idea. So when I started college, um, I believe I wanted to do pre-med so I could make a lot of money. And um, that ended up changing. So I took um, all of the two-year courses. So I love the liberal arts degree. And I didn't like it at first. I just thought, you know, why do I have to take these history classes or psychology classes? So then in taking that, I learned, um, I just started taking classes that I loved and then ended up having my bachelor's in sociology. So it definitely changed in what I wanted to do. And then as Clara was saying, um, I always got the questions like, what are you gonna do with that? And then now, with the position I'm in now, I can think of so, so many jobs that I could apply for, or different ways to go. So it's much more broad. So it started off being um, focused on making money. And then my degree went to taking classes that I love. And my work is now also involved in topics that I love and you know different things at the office each day or out in sites. So it's been exciting. I wanted to be Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> and um, Dr. Vandervin told me that um, profilers aren't real. So that was that day. Well, that's what you told our whole, you told our capstone that everyone wants to be Clarice Starling. And surprise, surprise, the job doesn't exist, so you all are screwed. Well, there's, there's three of them in the, in the world. And there, none of them are up here, yeah. so. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe. Yeah, it kind of, yeah, it kind of yeah. relates. I do investigations. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a really lame comparison, but um, yeah. still interested in criminology, though, and um, violent offenders, which I know sounds really weird, but still interested in that and interacting with that population. I took a career development class in my sophomore year, and. Um, they said that a popular answer for that was you wanted to be the person that like trains whales and dolphins at SeaWorld. Well, that's what I wanted to do. So um, I'm really close. But um, I, uh, the only thing I think that's translated, I, I'm similar to Stacy that I, uh, I just started taking classes that I loved and that was criminology. So that kind of translated. And um, the only thing I think that I loved when I was little that I still, that is in this job now is uh, writing. There's, that's not the not so glamorous part of the job is lots of reports, lots of narratives, and I, I write more than I'm out in my cruiser. So, uh, I wanted to be a police officer, um, so what I do now really corresponds to that because when they find someone that's mentally ill that goes to jail, they just pass them right on to me. So it's kind of just one to the other. But I wanted to work in the community. I wanted every day to be different, and that's exactly what I do now. I get to drive around a lot. Um, every new case is different, just like every new call is different. So um, I still see myself as, as kind of working in the community, helping to helping to keep people safe. That's a connection that we hadn't made before we met today. Was yeah. that um, I we we call them EDPs, emotionally disturbed people, 
And when we go, it's usually a suicide call. They've, they, maybe they've taken some pills and drank some alcohol. Um, they're having some emotional problems. And what we do is we talk to them. We, we say, we think it's best that you, you speak to a counselor or you, uh, you get some help with this, with these thoughts and these feelings you're having. And we transport them to Oblenis where they're what we call a pre-screen for, um, for problems, I guess, mental suicide. problems. Yeah, suicide. And um, if, they're, if it's deemed serious enough, he, he takes over from yeah. there. So. I had a wide range of things I wanted to do. I think I came in as a graphic design major. And then I uh, <laughs> didn't really have the portfolio to do that, I guess. And I got, I got frustrated with the application process and going through that whole thing. So I don't know, I, I guess it, it just kind of built on me that, that sociology was, I think we all said that classes that I enjoyed taking. Uh, and then I could see applying that, I guess, in a real world sense with, um, you know, the minor in business and uh, being able to facilitate and manage organizations that, that are doing good for the community is, is something that has really, I guess, latched on onto my psyche and it's something that I enjoy doing now. So that's where things came together. So where do you all, oh, I'm sorry, Claire. No, I was just saying it's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. And it made me think, where do you see yourself in 10 years? So we know where you came from. Where are you going to? <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> this is a weird day for me because this is actually my last official capacity at the job I'm in now. I'm moving to Colorado next week. So this is kind of a, a weird last thing to be explaining to people. But I, I guess uh, I'd like to continue my work, at least in the nonprofit field. I certainly want to get to you know a director, executive level, and uh, really be the one making all the decisions and driving uh, change and, and impacting communities <coughs> as positive as I can. So that's really been my focus the last few years, and, and that that was something that just came into focus for me, I guess, as of a couple years ago. Mine's very similar to yours. So um, with this position, I fell in love with nonprofits and how complex they are. Um, we pull in millions and millions of dollars in donations and you know, serve six counties and um, millions of meals. So seeing the development team and all of these different aspects of nonprofits, so I could see myself staying in this position, so just gaining the experience and taking on more responsibilities. Um, so this would be a career path I'd like to stick with. Yeah, I see myself, I mean, probably same job. I love the people I work with. I love my environment, my supervisor. I mean, depending on how long he stays, I don't know when he plans on retiring. Um, eventually, possibly moving over into the private sector. It's a little more lucrative. And the one thing I regret, I mean, my job, it's the public sector. And so we get massive and massive and massive amounts of cases. And we don't get much time to work on them. It's kind of touch and go, touch and go, touch and go, because there's just hundreds of people that we need to interview and hundreds of things we need to do in the private sector you kind of get to focus on one case and go a little more in depth so possibly that um i'll be moving back up to cleveland next year which is where i'm originally from and cleveland has a host of mental health and forensic services so i think i'd love to serve on like the treatment team for like a mental health court or direct a program like that, um, or be yeah, be some kind of in some kind of supervisory position with a criminal justice forensic uh, mental health agency. Um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff up there, you know, so that's where I'd like to be. One thing I'm sure of is that I want to stay in Athens. Um, everyone I graduated with, all my friends, they left, and they're like, I want to be back. And I'm sure <laughs> everyone here can relate to that. Um, Athens is a special place, but. Um, I think that if any of you guys are considering a, a career in law enforcement, I've been thinking about my future and thinking about what it would be like if I left law enforcement. And it's, um, it's so unique and it's so rewarding that I think it would be really tough to live a life that wasn't this life. First of all, I'd have to pick out my outfits in the morning, which I hate. <laughs> <laughs> but besides all that, it's just, it's so different. And I don't think I could ever go from this to sitting in a classroom, mm. or, or not a classroom, I'm, I'm excited about that. <laughs> but sitting in, um, sitting at a desk and, and typing away at a computer all day long, I just, that's not the life for me. And um, if you want every day to be different, exciting, this is the, this is a good job. Uh, I wouldn't. That's, that's kind of the problem. Um, 
the jobs that I've been focusing on or at least looking at hard is um, they're, they're in Cleveland, they're in Cincinnati, they're in Columbus, they're in those big hubs. And um, the thing about federal jobs is you're kind of at the whim of your employers and if they want you to move to Colorado, you gotta go to Colorado. And um, that's kind of just the nature of the beast. But um, so I guess I'm, I'm still working on that. I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that. Um, so, uh, would each of you just give us the very short, abbreviated bullet points of how they can get your job? So, if they're graduating, not your, you didn't know what I mean. <laughs> how can they do, do what you do? So, for example, AmeriCorps. How do you get into AmeriCorps? How do you become a cop? You get the idea. Networking, networking, networking. I got mine. I took an unpaid internship. It's all about you guys have heard it a thousand times, it's all about who you know. My, legitimately, my course of action was my aunt's best friend from high school does mitigation at the state PD. I'm the county, I'm the county friend from county PD. Does mitigations at the state PD. Brought me in, unpaid internship, it was a brand new position. Work here a couple days a week and I would run around with the investigators doing, you know, the grunt work, whatever they needed. And one of the investigators at the state PD was engaged is now married to an attorney at my job. Hey, there's new positions. Are you interested in getting a job there? Yes, okay, her fiance put my resume on my now boss's desk. And it's just, it's just connection, that's all it was. Yeah, connections are very, very, very important. Um, uh, I think bullet point internships, if you have the luxury of interning or working somewhere while you're taking classes, if you have the time and you're committed to a certain organization around Athens, do it. Because if you can get out of here with that on your resume, it's a big help. Golden. Yeah, it's a big help. So I ran into that. I didn't do um, internships or too much outside of coursework and then, you know, waitressing and whatnot while I was here. So when I um, finished with my master's, I had six years of experience in a classroom. And when I was applying for jobs, they were wanting three to five years of experience. So it's common to see three to five, which I was you know, surprised by. So um, with AmeriCorps, it's not too complicated because you're living off of a stipend. Um, I found positions all throughout Ohio and applied for them and um, you know, got call, calls back to all of those, whereas with job applications, I you know, didn't have the experience that they were looking for, or if someone else is applying who's already been trained in that area, then the company you know, would save money on not having to train them, whereas I would need training. Um, so with AmeriCorps, it's, it's not a complicated application. You can send it out to, up to 10 different places. So I got a lot of um, experience interviewing across Ohio, places that were willing to pay for me to come out and meet them to interview for the position. So I took the one um, at the food bank. It's not um, too competitive because you know, it is volunteer based, but if I was to sell AmeriCorps to you, um, I don't have to make a student loan payment for a year, which is something a lot of, a lot of you might come into contact with, so that's been nice. Um, they're paying all of the interest. My loans will be cut in half. Um, my health insurance is covered 100%. I get to take college courses for free and then since I picked a place that's so broad, I'm learning aspects of all different parts of the company. And um, there's been several times where different directors and the vice president and CEO have made sure that I would be applying for a position with them. So a lot of AmeriCorps positions, they might not hire you in afterwards if it's a very small nonprofit, but you could always pick a place that's growing and is going to have job applications. So they know who you are and you have the experience. So it's very similar to an internship, but there's a lot of benefits that come with it. So um, another thing, maybe in your first year at your job, you might have to be there for a year before you get a week vacation or sick benefits and whatnot. So my first year doing this right out of college, I get 10 sick days and 10 personal days, and they know that I'm a volunteer. So if I need to come to Athens for a weekend to visit, then getting that time off. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Um. Getting into police work, there, there are similar aspects like um, volunteering, there's um, uh, experience and networking, all that stuff. Um, I actually did an inter informational interview with the chief two years before I even applied. I didn't even know I wanted to do police work. So um, some of the unique things, um, uh, stay out of trouble, 
that's that's kind of unusual. Like the people who did my background check at work know me better than my parents, and it's a little creepy. But um, uh, yeah, so stay out of trouble. Don't get arrested for anything if you can avoid it. Um, <laughs> uh, what else? Um, ride-alongs. I can I, can I do a plug here? Uh, we do ride-alongs at OUPD. All you have to do is um, write your name and your date of birth. We make sure that you don't have any felony warrants, and you can come and ride with us for the night. I suggest Friday or Saturday. And um, you just see what we do, and it, it's pretty fun. But, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I, I did that kind of in my free time when I was an undergrad. And um, by the time I applied, people around town knew me, a law enforcement community around town knew me. So um, I guess that kind of goes along with networking. Just get your face out get there, get your name out there. And that way when you come and you come in for that, um, that physical test, you come in for that written test, they know who you are. Um, that's another kind of unique thing is that uh, you have to stay somewhat physically fit. It's one of the only jobs that requires you to, you know, do push-ups for the application. So, Just like everyone else said, internships, I did two internships in my three-year undergrad. So I graduated with a year of experience in probation and parole. So when I interviewed for this job, the interview literally went, how do we do this? because this is a new program, putting someone in mental health in the jail. And I was basically able to say, this is what I can do, bang, bang, bang. And then that was, it was like the deal was sealed. It was, that was it. So um, just getting experience in your undergrad while you're taking classes is a huge thing. And then I rode along with cops in Athens for like a year before I graduated. So I sat in my interview and I was just able to name stuff off about the community. I just knew the place where I wanted to work I knew the Athens and Southeast Ohio community, and that just made me so much more um, hireable. So if you're interviewing for a job in Cleveland, just, I don't know, research the Cleveland area, research what your company does, what the place you want to work at does, and then um, just establish those links. It just makes you so much more uh, friendly and just appealing. Uh, to keep it short and quick, I found it useful to have some understanding of how organizations work and administratively work within an organization. So business minor helped. Um, having some experience with languages helps. These are all things that you can boost your resume with. Applied a bunch of different places when I first came out, so don't be afraid to kind of broaden your horizons and you're likely not going to get the first position that you look at and really want. So be able to be flexible. And then when you do find yourself in a position or, or have an opportunity to um, advance yourself or go into something that you're a little bit more interested in. Be sure to volunteer your time or, or express yourself that you're interested in going into a different department or area. And uh, at least the organization I've worked with has been very accommodating to that um, and open to that. So You have to sell yourself, be mm -hmm. charismatic, social. That resume, there are millions of people with your exact qualifications. You have to be regular. <laughs> Cares, oh. Yeah, be regular, be charismatic, sell yourself. Shamelessly. Shamelessly. <laughs> and then work at, like, once you get the job, obviously. Well, eventually. I have a question from the audience. I'm just I did the, I got the leadership and development certificate, and I think that looks good on a resume. Anything with, starting with an L looks good, or I guess anything with leader in it, just just throw that on there, it just looks good. There's a lot of words with an L that wouldn't look good. Um, but that class, that I think it was like a two-day thing, that leadership course taught resume skills and interviewing skills, and then how to formulate a resume, and then how to communicate in an interview, and I definitely credit that to the resume that got me my job just because I a lot of people you'll see resumes and they just they'll put dashes and that's about it but this those kinds of classes offered through the university will tell you how to make your resume look good and uh, they'll do it all for free so it's really great I took my resume into the fifth floor of Baker yeah. I'm not sure if that's that's, that's where that is right. yeah and um I took it in there at least five times and they just they edited it gave it back edited it more um, and that helped me a lot because, I mean, if you're starting out brand new, like, 
you sometimes you don't even know where to start. Like a resume, what is what does my company want? You know, what is this? Um, I did mine through an email with that same location, and they had just emailed back that this is something they'd really need to work with me on in person <laughs> due to um, all of the errors. And I was able to meet with somebody else one on one and kind of go over that process. But it was good to send it off to know that it takes a lot of work, and it still does. Updating a resume it takes a lot of work. I don't want to backtrack, but I kind of want to touch on the, the previous question. Suck up to your professors. Become, become someone your professors want to talk to. Someone you could just go back and forth with and banter with because you never know the connections that they're going to have. I mean, his wife works in the mental health. You know, if you, I don't want to go into criminology, but I'm really interested in mental health. Oh, my wife does blah, 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 and she just had this position open. Like, become friends and suck up to your professors. Do it. <laughs> well, sorry. Sorry. You don't have to just suck up, you might actually like them. Too. Well, yeah, <laughs> if you're really lucky, you might, you might actually, actually enjoy talking to them. Yeah. But if you don't, fake it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sociology. Uh -huh. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say in regards to um, mental illness and working with mental health, um, what is probably like your favorite aspect of your job every day, just seeing as it's like a difficult population to work with? Like what do you look most forward to on a day to day basis? Um. I think the, coor the coordination among agencies is a lot of fun. So coordinating someone's case with the police or with job and family services or with their public defender, with the DD system, I literally work with everyone and everywhere. Um, people with mental illness and people in poverty um, pull resources from numerous agencies. And if you're a case manager, you help them to maximize those benefits because they just can't do it themselves, either because they're not aware of it or because because of their illness they just can't do it. Um, so just being able to be friends with so many different people and get on the phone and talk to so many different types of uh, coworkers is a lot of fun. And just working actually with people with severe mental illness is cool because you just get to read about it, um, what they struggle with, what it looks like, and then you actually get to see that in front of you. And it gets, yeah, it gets your adrenaline pumping a lot. Um, and it's just cool to talk to people about the, vers the voices they hear in their head. Yeah. I mean, just seeing how they act and getting them into treatment, stuff like that. It's just a lot of fun. So when you go back to Cleveland, do you see yourself more of working like downtown, like at the Justice Center, um, or do you see more of yourself in like an independent agency? I think it's, it, it depends on where I'm living and what my family looks like. Mm -hmm. um, my commute's like three minutes right now, right. and that's kind of where I want to keep it. Um, I think I think there's a lot of there's definitely more need downtown, mm -hmm. and in the different areas of this inner city of Cleveland. So right. that's probably where I'd go, just because it'd be more opportunity. Um, so yeah, definitely where the need is, I'll go. Are you familiar with the yeah, yeah. So a lot of people in jail uh, are duly diagnosed mental illness and substance abuse. So linkage to the Vivitrol program is one of the big things in the jail right now. Um, okay, yeah. So um, people have a lot of questions about that, uh, especially if they're mentally ill and they're super stressed that they're going to be back on drugs when they get out. So um, courting with Ruben, and I go to the Vivitrol meetings in the jail. You do. Yeah. So um, that's just, yeah, so working with Ruben, working with Del Parole, and then going to those meetings and staying up to date on what clients are doing, that's just, you know, another hour of the week that I get to sit in on something cool like that, just because there's always, there's always got to be some, someone from mental health there um, to represent, so, yeah, that's cool, though. I think it's really interesting that for each of you, there's this common element of working with a variety of resources, a variety of, you know, you network to get into your job, but your jobs involve, you know, all these different dimensions and multiple dimensions, and you have to be able to put the pieces together. And I know that's something that sociology helps us to do, is to pull the desperate pieces together and see how they function um, as a whole. So, yeah. Uh, so I noticed that. And then also the other thing that all of you said uh, is that you like going to a job where every day it's different. 
Yeah, that was a common theme, it seems like. Uh, I don't think all sociology jobs are like that, but certainly the ones we have up here represent that. Probably a lot of entry level, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of yeah. bouncing around and doing what we need. True. True. Another question. The panel is scheduled to go to 2.30. Um, if, we, if we want, what we could do is uh, break up and maybe network individually. If you all want to talk with the panelists some, that's great. If you need to go to class, that's fine too. Um, but yeah, let's, let's uh, give a round of applause for the panel. Uh, we sure do appreciate you all coming back to Athens to share your experiences with us. So thank you.